everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Colleen Vincent. I am the Vice President of Community for the James Beard Foundation, a 501c3 organization whose mission is to celebrate, support, and elevate the people behind America's food culture and champion a standard of good food and anchored in talent, equity, and sustainability. Today's discussion honors the life and legacy of Mrs. Emily Maguette, 2023 James Beard Foundation Book Awards nominee and author of the New York Times bestseller, Gullah Geechee Home Cooking, Recipes from the Matriarch of Disto Island, the first Gullah Geechee cookbook published by a major U.S. publisher. Mrs. Maguette was born on November 19, 1932 on Disto Island, South Carolina, and grew up steeped in Gullah Geechee a distinct African-American ethnic group and vibrant Creole culture with its own language and culinary traditions, born of West and Central Africans enslaved along the Southeast Coastal Corridor. Though Mrs. Mayette passed on April 21st, 2023, her legacy lives on in her book and the many lives she touched along the way. And so I am pleased to start introducing you to some of those lives that she touched. Um, including her daughters, Laverne and Marvette Maguette, uh, two daughters out of a, 10 kids. Um, <laughs> but these two daughters, um, which Mrs. Maguette lovingly referred to as the general and the corporal, um, you know, kind of kept their mom together and helped keep this project on track and also continue to champion her legacy um, upon her passing. Kayla Stewart, uh, James Beard Award-winning food and travel journalist, cookbook author, educator, and the editor of Eater Houston. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Eater, Travel and Leisure, Food and Wine, and others, and she is the co-author of the book. And last, but certainly not least, Chef Terrence Harvey. Seasoned chef and recipe developer, he's worked on numerous te test kitchens and has developed recipes for publications like Food 52 and the New York Times. In 2022, he was featured on Food Network's Chopped and ultimately came out Chopped Champion. He is currently the executive sous chef at Platform by JBF, where he oversees all aspects of day-to-day -day operations. And he worked as a food stylist for the book. Um, and we're going to find out a little bit more about the nicknames um, that Miss Emily had for some of the <laughs> folks here on the screen. But, you know, I just wanted to give you all a chance to um, say hello um, I know that this uh, this particular discussion has generated a lot of excitement and interest um, around Mrs. Emily. And so, you know, essentially, I'm going to you know, ask you guys what it was like to be around her, to work with her. So let's let's set the setting. Let's let's talk to the kids. And uh, you guys have had um, a wonderful time getting to know Laverne and Marvette and and um, hearing their amazing stories. So just set the scene for us. Tell us a little bit about what life was like um, when you when your mom was growing up, what it was like when you were growing up uh, with your mom. So this this is Laverne. So and thank you so much for having us today. So when my mom was growing up, my mom grew up during the Jim Crow era, you know, where racial segregation was enforced and, you know, basically legalized. So this was during a time when people of color, that's what they were called back then. They were called African-Americans. They were separated from whites in schools, jobs, and public gathering places. So I can only imagine that it was, you know, a difficult time uh, for her. But from the stories that my mom uh, told us, her family, they basically lived off of the land. They grew their own uh, crops and everything. And they didn't have much. So they had no running water. They had no electricity, no transportation. At that time, they had no voting rights. Uh, she told us about how she walked five miles to school uh, every day. She even had to walk to work when she got her first uh, job. And her first job was uh, a babysitter. And so she had to work, she had to walk to work and she only made like a dollar and 25 cents a day when she babysat. So my mom really worked for pennies. She earned like $11 and 15 cents a week and with 10 children, but she made it. So when she grew up, 
times were very different and times were hard back then, but she she endured it. So she she went through a lot, but she she endured it. So it was that was her time when she grew up. So when of course when I grew up uh, on Edisto in the nineteen sixties, it was challenging, mm -hmm. but it was different because things were beginning to change. So for me, it was like more civilization. We had electricity. We finally got running water. You know, the family had transportation of their own. My mom them didn't have that. You know, of course, we worked in the fields as well. My mom took us to the fields with her. We picked beans. We picked okra, cucumbers, or whatever. And so, but when my mom went to school, um, you know, school wasn't integrated. Schools didn't become integrated until like 1954. But then um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 you know, it prohibited segregation and discrimination based on um, race and public facilities, uh, including schools. And then we had the voting acts, right, uh, also. Mm -hmm. So that was a change for people of, of color or African-American. But my childhood growing up on Edisto Island overall was good. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything uh, in the world. We were poor and didn't know that we were poor because we had plenty to eat. We had a roof over our head and we had clean clothes. So we thought we were rich, even though we were poor. So, so my upbringing, you know, and the things that my parents and the elderly people on Edisto Island taught me, that helped shape my life today. And I really appreciate that. So life was pretty good. And I, you know, and I appreciate you sharing, like, you know, I thought that we were rich because oftentimes <laughs> when we're children, you know, we get what we get, right? right. Um, and what you were getting at the time was clean clothes, healthy, fresh, unprocessed food, yeah. a place to play, you know, yeah. water and sunshine. So I, I haven't been to Edisto. So I'm going to ask <laughs> Terrence and Kayla kind of what their impressions are, were when they, when they, you know, made landfall there. It sounds amazing. Um, so I kind of, I want your perspective on, on, on the place and we're, we're setting the scene here um, for the rest of our storytelling. Kayla, you want to go first? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and such an honor to be here. Um, when I was first tasked with this book, I um, decided to visit Miss Emily um, prior to actually officially being on the book. I decided to go and see her. I just so happened to be um, traveling through the South on a different assignment. Um, and, you know, realized that uh, this might be an opportunity to actually meet this person in, uh, in real life and see if this was a good fit. Um, when I drove there, it felt like being um, in sort of an indie film, to be honest. It felt like being in its own, I was in my own little world. Um, I was by myself at the time. And, you know, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Texas um, with roots in Louisiana. So I'm very familiar with the region, but I had not been to that part of the South um, at this particular point. Um, this was still very new to me. Um, and so I had a lot of imagery of what South Carolina was like. And all of a sudden, this imagery started coming to life. I was surrounded by sea moss. There were these just magnificent oak trees. There was, you know, I was passing along. You drive into Edisto, you drive, as Miss Emily said, you got to cross that bridge, right, to get to Edisto Island. Um, and you're driving over just these stunning, magnificent, shimmering waters um, that are just so calm and so serene. Um, and those are two words that I think best describe my experience of both uh, being introduced to Miss Emily, but also of being and working on Edisto. It is this calm, peaceful oasis that, of course, Miss Emily, being the vibrant person that she was, <laughs> made it more lively uh, and, you know, as exciting as it was. Um, but that was the beauty of Edisto. And I, you know, certainly Mar Marvette and Laverne can speak to it much better than I can, of course. My interpretation of Miss Emily is that that is what that's one of the many reasons why she decided to live her life there. Um, mm -hmm. She was not going to leave this place. She made that very clear to me uh, when we met that this had been her home all this time, that she loved it and that there were very particular reasons for that. And I think some of those reasons center around um, her being able to live in a peaceful way and being able to 
live her life and do the things that she wanted to do and that brought her joy. Um, and so that was my original impression of it. And of course, when you meet someone like Miss Emily, you all of a sudden understand that for someone to be this unique, this special, this magnificent, there has to be something special here. It has to be something specific about the place that this person is from, the community that they are surrounded by, um, and the home that they've made. And so those are my first initial thoughts when I met her. Thank you, Kayla and Terrence. Hi, everyone. Um, so I grew up in California, So, but I grew up eating Southern food a lot. So when I was brought onto the project, we got all the recipes. And then when I started seeing everything, it started being very familiar food to me. So when I started seeing everything, I was like, oh, this, this, all this food is something that I've really seen before. So, which is not something that I'm used to in food styling. I'm doing a lot of like, not Southern food and food styling and like recipe testing and recipe developing. So I was really excited when I saw the recipes. And then when I got to Edison, like the setting was very like Southern vibes. It reminded me of, um, what's the movie where life is like a box of chocolates? You never know what you're going to get. Forrest Gump. Yes, Gump. yes, yeah. Yes. It, um, it immediately brought me to like Forrest Gump, just with all the sea moss and everything coming down. It was really gorgeous and like very peaceful. When I got there, I was like, wow. Like I get to be here for the next two and a half weeks. I was like, well, this is going to be a beautiful project. And then driving down, there's like a lot of like long roads that you have to go down that are just covered in like weeping willows and like sea moss. And so it just really kind of brought me like peace. And then when we got there, we did a tour of everywhere we were going to shoot. So we went to Miss Emily's house first and then we went there and then her house is just beautiful. She lives on like maybe like three fourths of an acre, I'd say. And it's just like beautiful trees. And then we went, we shot at another spot too, one of her friend's house, Miss Becky. And she lives on this beautiful property that's like beachfront and just like, it was really gorgeous. And it was just like really nice, like deep Southern vibes that were like very peaceful to me. Thank you, Terrence. And, and thank you guys for setting the scene. I think, you know, oftentimes those of us who are not from the South or weren't raised in the South, um, you know, have this impression of the South that I think is in many ways the exact opposite, um, that uh, there is a reason that people stay in this place, not just because of heritage and roots, but because, you know, access to healthy foods, access to culturally significant foods. Um, and so, you know, thank you guys for setting that scene. And you mentioned Miss Emily's house. And so I want to ask um, Laverna Marvet, you know, what it was like growing up in that house. And the reason I ask this question is because here's your mom, you know, she's working for different families and cooking for a lot of people. And then she's got a whole child army in the house. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I want to know what it was like growing up, you know, what, what, you know, how did she wrangle y'all, get y'all fed, get y'all sorted out? Like, how did that, how did that go when y'all were growing up? Well, for me, I'll answer on my part, being the youngest, things were a lot different when I came along because all the older ones had already had everything in place. So my mom had instructions for everybody else and they had their chores and I was the baby. So <laughs> I didn't do a whole lot. I wouldn't take credit for doing a whole lot because my other sisters and brothers would say, oh, she didn't do anything. But my mom kind of protected me and spoiled me. Although she went to work, the others, uh, my other siblings had to look after me and take care of me. And they would call me spoil rotten and they would, you know, sometimes spank me or whatever. And then I'm always going to tell because I'm mommy's baby. So, you know, the things that they did I didn't have to do a whole lot of it. Hanging clothes on the line. My job was to stand there and my mom would fold the clothes and put it in my hand. I put it in the basket. They had to wash the clothes, hang it on the line, fold it and bring it in the house and iron it. And I didn't get to do any of that. So lucky me. But anyway, life was just, you know, like she said, we were poor, but we didn't know that we were poor because we had the best life ever and having not just my sisters and brothers we had other people that came into our house at the same time and we didn't know any better we just treated everybody like they belong there and that's how my mom treated them 
like they belong. And, you know, whatever she did for us, she's done for the other uh, people that was there or whatever she made for us. She made for everybody else. She would work and come home and work for her children as well. Make sure we had, you know, food, clean clothes, like Laverne said. And life was just beautiful for me because being the last one, it wasn't that many of us in the house at the time. It was, uh, I'm going to call her Dee Dee. Everybody know her as Elizabeth, but we call her Dee Dee. It was Dee Dee and myself um, at the time. You know, all my other sisters and brothers, they'd already kind of left us there. And we were the last two hanging around, wondering what we were going to do. But it was, you know, quite a beautiful life for myself, I would say that. And I'm sure my other siblings would have a whole lot of other stuff <laughs> to say about the whippings and all that that they have received based on, you know, life. So for me, let me just say that mommy, that's what I call her affectionately, mommy, uh, she was a disciplinarian more so than my dad was. And so she loved us enough to make sure we had plenty of chores, <laughs> washing dishes for a week at a time, washing clothes and ironing them, cleaning up the house, uh, mop and wax the floor. God, we did that like every Saturday. And also helping out in the kitchen while she was there, you know, cooking so we could learn how to cook because the older children had to help take care of the uh, younger children. And so we were taught how our father prayers at a very early age. And we lived in a four room house. There was two bedrooms and then a kitchen and another space that we call the living room. So in one, in one room, my mom had two beds. So, you know, there's 10 of us. So we slept four to a bed, two to the head, two to the foot. And my brother slept on a cot in the kitchen, Marvette being the baby, slept in the bed with my mom and dad. But I think that connection made us close as siblings because we all slept, you know, uh, together. And of course, you know, we would always say, well, don't blow your breath in my face or whatever. But, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's where the closeness uh, comes in, uh, as well. And so, you know, Sunday dinners was cooked on um, Saturday night, you know, because we went to church every Sunday. That was mandatory. We went to church uh, every Sunday. And we always had desserts on Sunday. We always had, I can remember it vividly, we always had pound cake and sliced peaches on Sunday. You know, that was our, that, that was our uh, dessert. And then my mom ruled with the iron fist because she always taught us to respect our elders and but also acknowledge God and everything that you do. But the one good thing about growing up there is that everybody knew my mom. Our house was like the gathering place where children came and played. And if we were mischievous or bad, my neighbors had permission to whip us. And then when my mom got home, we got another whipping. So it would be in your best, you know, to be on your best behavior because you know you was going to get a whipping when she got home. But that helped us to become whom we are today. That was just who she was. And that so, that, that happened in school as well. If we yes. were bad in school, <laughs> yeah. the same thing. The teachers had the authority to whip us in school and we came home okay. and my mom already knew about it, but didn't ask any questions, but we knew it was coming. Yeah. We knew yeah. whipping or whatever punishment was coming. I see the diaspora. We all shaking our head because <laughs> we are familiar with those things, you know, and, and what's funny is that, you know, you know, Terrence and Kayla, like you were part of this um, kind of um, archiving of her legacy. And by the time you meet her, she's already, you know, kind of an iconic individual. And I'm going to ask you guys about that um, in a minute. But Kayla and Terrence, um, what was it like 
um, working with her and documenting her story and then also seeing her connection, not only to her children, but to the community, like engaging with her storytelling, having, you know, all this prior information, like this woman is, you know, an, <laughs> is an iconic individual and here I'm working with her hands, you know, hands taking notes, recording, you know, typing stuff, um, getting hands in the food. What was, what was that experience like? So I'm going to set the stage a little bit here just to give some context. Um, I uh, jumped on this project about a year after finishing my master's degree, I would say, and in the heart of the pandemic. So there was a lot going on at this particular time. Um, I was still getting adjusted to the industry um, and this incredible opportunity was presented. Um, and Miss Emily and I had an immediate bond. Um, there was an immediate sense of trust there was an immediate sense of appreciation. Um, I was very forthcoming with her about my background. Um, I'm not Gullah Geechee, um, and I wanted, I was concerned about that when, with this project, I wanted to be very, you know, conscious of that. Um, I do, I, you know, I certainly, obviously have a background in African-American history, but I actually have a, a minor in African-American studies. So yes, I, I obviously had the, you know, I think I had the skill set there, but I wanted to be conscious of you know where we were uh miss emily did not care she said that i could write <laughs> and she said that i was kind and therefore we all work together um and so it worked out um i immersed myself in the culture even though i'm not going to get you i obviously been very familiar with the culture um in the community and so getting to be with miss emily was essentially taking it beyond what I'm reading online, what I'm learning from, uh, you know, individuals and, and people I'm meeting, but someone I actually genuinely know. Uh, Miss Emily was extremely dynamic, extremely excited. And I think some, you know, I and I think this is not just Miss Emily, I think it often happens to women who are elders. Um, there's kind of this, you know, comforting grandma-ness about uh, these people. And absolutely that matters. And absolutely that is a part of Miss Emily. But Miss Emily was also deeply intelligent. And I don't know that we describe older women in that way. Miss um, Emily was a brilliant, brilliant and skilled woman. And she very much um, led with intention and with just brilliant. She knew, she knew texture, she knew taste, she knew history, even, you know, not necessarily in the ways that we might communicate um, in our modern world. Miss Emily knew way more than I ever will. <laughs> and, I, and I say that uh, as someone who loves to read, as someone who loves to travel, Miss Emily just was a smart woman about her community, her life, and, you know, her perspective on the world. And I learned so much from her. Um, watching her with food specifically, you know, that's where I saw that intellect, right? This was someone who, you know, she may not have the specific word for it, but she's understanding the chemistry that's happening, right? She's understanding the science of the food and she might not communicate it using that specific language, but she knows exactly what is happening at every specific specific second of a dish cooking. And it was fascinating to observe. Um, she was very conscientious about the work that she was doing, she was always concerned about others. I never left that house unfed. Um, I often <laughs> left with more food to take uh, back to my hotel I was staying at at the time. Um, one memory in particular always stands out with Miss Emily. We were working on this book and many people have raised this and a lot of the writing that's been done around her and a lot of the conversations, she's this incredibly kind and generous person. And to put that <laughs> into some perspective, you know, no one left, and I mean, no one left Miss Emily's house without eating or being, you know, given the sense of, you know, just genuine hospitality. We were working very hard one day and testing a number of recipes. It was a very busy day. And we were in a point of the work they would, you know, in my, you know, my perspective, we keep going, you know, things are kind of in motion. Miss Emily stopped us. We're at this very important part of our interview. And she says, there's a plumber who stopped by today. Um, something was wrong with the house. I'm not sure quite what it was, but the plumber has been outside this entire time. And of course, I'm not really thinking about him. I'm focusing on Miss Emily. She stops our call because she says that she's got to fix the plumber plate. And so this person <laughs> has met Miss Emily for the first time today. <laughs> this is the first day that Miss Emily has met this man. And still she was going to stop our work because she felt that this person needed to be fed, needed to be cared for, um, and needed attention. And that's really the way that she moved about in the world. That's how she interacted with friends. 
with how she interacted with loved ones and of course watching her with Laverne and you know I saw her with with her all her children but particularly Marvette and Laverne and while of course you know we're trying to get this project done we're in this professional mode it was always 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 rooted in love Miss Emily just led with this kindness with this generosity with love and I saw her pour that into both her food but also her children um and again I just feel lucky to have witnessed it and um lucky to have been a part of a part of the project Thank you so much, Kayla. And and Terrence, you know, um, what was your experience in engaging with her, you know, her storytelling, her her kind of community focused ethos, um, you know, through the food styling? Yeah. So I'll do a little like background life setting of like the mm -hmm. moment. So I, I believe the shoot, was it 2021 or 2020? I think it was 20. 2021, like beginning of 2021, like spring. And so I was doing pop-ups. I, I was unemployed full-time, but I was doing a lot of pop-ups and I was work. I had a business partner. Her name was Luciana Lamboy. She's a big food stylist in the industry. She did like Kwame's book. She's pretty well known. And so uh, Clay Williams, he was the photographer slash producer. So he was in charge of like bringing on all of the creatives, like on the set side of things. And so he brought on Lucy, then Lucy brought me on. And then, so I was in like a mode of like doing the pop-ups. I was really trying to like find myself as a chef because I like, I'm mostly a chef, but food, dabble in like food media a bit. So I was mo really trying to like find myself and like figure myself out as a chef through the pop-ups, like try to figure out what type of cuisine I do. And I was like, dabbling in like African food and like Southern food and like contemporary American, you know, whatever that means. And then so when I got brought onto the project, it was a lot of like Southern, very deep Southern rooted things, Gullah Geechee, because you know, that food is really rooted in like Southern food. And when I got there, she was very like open and she really took me in with open arms. And then when we started working on the actual recipes, it was like a very, she was very educational. Like I felt like I learned a lot about myself. Like she truly gave me a sense of self when it came to cooking that types of food because I had grew up cooking that food, but then to be around Miss Emily, who's like a legend and an icon, she really taught me like the basis and foundation of where that food really came from. And like, cause you know, Gullah Geechee, like I'm, I eat Southern food. I grew up eating all that Southern food, but Gullah Geechee takes it a step, really roots it down. You know, that's like Africa, they came to America and then you have Gullah Geechee and then it's preserved. And then we have the Southern food. So she really helped me understand like where I came from in a sense on the culinary perspective and really like gave me, I feel like she gave me a foundation of like where I am, like who I am as a chef, where I am in my career. And like, even outside of food, like she helped me like come to terms with a lot of things and like change my mindset on how I view just like the whole transatlantic slave trade thing, you know? Cause you can get very upset about that whole thing, especially as like, I'm 27, like thinking about it, like if I really sit and think about all of that it really upsets me. She really helped me understand like where, like how to like accept, like not accept, but like think about it in a progressive way, you know? And just with the food, with the culture, cause she has some, Miss Emily has some stories. <laughs> she has some <laughs> she <laughs> she has some stories like on that shoot we had we had a lot of time the shoot was like two and a half weeks and we was in the house and Miss Emily Miss Emily had was cooking with us she had hands of everything and there was a lot of downtime because you know with shoots when they're actually taking the photos like the that's Clay doing his photographer thing and we're over there and so me and Miss Emily really had a lot of time to sit down and talk just about her past and just the people she was cooking for and the way she was describing it, she she would say things that would upset the way, she would say things that would upset people, but she was like, you can't be upset about things like that because it's just what it was, you know? 
So, yeah. <laughs> I get you. I hear you, Terrence. Yeah. What I yeah, I hear a couple of things. One is, you know, Miss Emily was around for a long time, and it, <laughs> she she you know she definitely is in in line with those griots essentially people who preserve culture by remembering and by doing. And so you know she does this project um, that wasn't of her prior experience because everything was learned by doing and so this is leading to my next question because you know it took many hands to get this book together besides you three you know um Jonathan Cooper as well as um Clay and Lucy and um and I know that um among those that kind of pushed her to do this book um include uh Mrs. Miss Becky Smith and BJ Dennis so my question is and I also have a second question, which is going to be like, what stories did she tell you that did not end up in publication? 20 ones, preferably, but you know, if it's cool, it's cool. Um, but how did, how did, how did folks get her to, how did they get her to finally say, you know what? Yes. Yes. I'm going to do this. And, and feel free, Kayla, feel free, Marvette and Laverne to respond to this question. What, what made her, what was the, the thing that made her say, you know what? Yes. Well, um, Becky Smith had a lot of encouraging words to her to tell her, Miss Emily, you know, you just cook so naturally and you don't think about, you know, what you need to put into this dish to make it a good dish. Everything you did was good. So Becky Smith kind of started, you know, sitting at her knees and just writing as my mom would talk and um do recipes and stuff. And Miss Becky Smith says, Emily, the world needs to know about you and your food. And she was like, well, okay, I'll do it. And it they've been working on it for over 20 years, but you know, thinking we were going nowhere with this. And then, you know, things came into play and we were on the brink of self-publishing. And BJ Dennis came in and, you know, asked my mom if she would, you know, consider that. And she was like, well, how long? We don't know until you spoke with the agent. And then he told her and things just started going really fast. And she was like, wow, two years. I don't think I'll be around for two more years to wait for a book to come about. But God saw fit that my mom waited for her latter years and God really blessed her during that time. He blessed her all along, but at her lat latter years, he sh made sure that she saw her mountaintop, whether the others saw it or not. My mom reached and saw her mountaintop. And I wanna give uh, thanks as well to Trelawney Michelle. The language that came into that book and her putting it into my mom's voice people will still tell you that they can hear Miss Emily talking. So thanks to Trelawney Michelle for putting that piece together and ensuring that, you know, this wasn't a third person. You got Miss Emily's voice. So um, it came about through Becky Smith and we thank her today and all the hard work, reading, <laughs> writing. My mom was not even interested in what, all the writing and typing and stuff that we had to do and helping uh, Kayla and, you know, getting stuff back. Every time we got home, hey, you got two hours, three hours. I'm like, we worked all day, but we still had to put this together for her. My mom says, what she knows is in her head, it's in her heart, it's in her hands. So I'm gonna leave that up to my girls because I can't type. <laughs> And we will call her and we'll tell her, mommy, you know, they want this. Well, that's not my problem. She wasn't really, you know, <laughs> she wasn't really, you know, geared up about, you know, the hype of everything that we were hyped about. Everything kind of, she was like, oh, that's okay. Oh, this is okay. Mommy didn't really get excited about a whole lot of stuff. It was just who she was. This is me every day. So it wasn't like she had to gain that, you know, from somebody else. She just had it naturally and she just did it. 
And we we just we were just so proud that you know this all came together and everybody just you know loved her and you know she would say certain things and she was like I'm gonna call Terrence what she called it TT we're gonna do this <laughs> TT I wouldn't and I don't want you jazzing up my food and you know he would he respect that from her and and you know when Kayla's writing she was like you know I don't know about this book because I think you know, people are going to say, well, how much do you do with this? Or how much do you do with that? So Kayla at the time measuring, did, Kayla did a lot of measuring yeah, gonna while ask. my mom did the, the cooking and pouring stuff or whatever. Kayla said, okay, well, I would think this is about, you know, three quarters of this or half of this. So she did it and they did a marvelous job working together. So we're just, you know, elated that an 89 year old at the time still well 87 at the time we got started with all this still could put all of this together and you know this is mine this is That's my work and nobody can take it away from me this yeah. is my work this is one of the most fascinating parts for me actually um is that you know we know how old people are, older black Absolutely. people are, you know, <laughs> set in a ways. And, and, you know, I, from my experience, it's like when they say it one way and you're like, what do you really mean? And mm -hmm, so, yeah. you know, essentially Terrence and Kayla, you, you guys took what was out of her head and mouth wow. and yeah. made it something that other people can access. So I want to know what that experience was like, because look, I know <laughs> what it's like <laughs> when you're, it's like, well, well, how much, you know, it's just a sprinkle of this and, a, you know, and it, they're like, well, I can't necessarily recreate that, but you guys enshrined it. So, and Terrence, let, let's talk about her telling you not to bougie yes, as her recipe. Yes. Yes. So, so <laughs> Kayla, you know, let's talk about like interpreting Miss Emily for, um, for the masses essentially. Absolutely. Um, well, first, I'm so glad that Mar that uh, Marvette brought Tr Trelawney up, uh, mm -hmm. which is absolutely, um, this was such a, a, not only a team effort, but every person involved had such a, played such a specific role and brought, uh, she just brought, you know, a layer of scholarly expertise or, you know, whatever, whatever component that was. Um, and Trelawney just really stepped in, particularly with Miss Emily's family's history. Um, but every single part of the book was, you know, checking to make, you know, making sure we're both work, working on her voice, making sure everything's in her voice, but also making sure that it's sensitive and true to the Gullah Geechee people. Um, so just as, you know, Terrence was working with Lucy and Clay, you know, all of these teams, everyone's playing a different role. Um, so with that in mind, um, what the people often don't know is when you're tasked as the writer of the book, <laughs> is that you're not only writing. <laughs> so I, I was writing, I was recipe testing, I was traveling, I was project managing, uh, I, was a, I did a lot. Um, and that is what you're tasked with when you're working on a book. Um, and it was wonderful. Um, it was a tremendous amount of work. It was a very fast turnaround. I have never written that much uh, that quickly. <laughs> and uh, I'm so thankful to God that it came out well. Um, it was a it was a feat. Um, but again, and, you know, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think for all of us, certainly I felt it was impossible to not do this well. It was impossible to not make sure that this project was done in a way that um, reflected this this woman and the life that she'd lived. And so, you know, I really spent time from the beginning just getting to Miss Emily's voice. And that meant just having some phone calls. And to be clear, I was not always the one calling. Miss Emily would call me. Miss <laughs> Emily might call me in the middle of the day while I'm interviewing someone. Miss Emily call me. I, she just called me to check on me. Um, she called me her daughter and it was so special um, because, um, yeah, she. I, it was very clear that she saw me um, beyond a writer. She saw me as, as someone she loved and cared for and showed that very clearly um, and very quickly. Um, Marvette and Laverne, I remember this, and I'm sure y'all were helping with this, but the first time I met Miss <laughs> Emily, I was welcome to a table full <laughs> of dishes. So That's from the beginning, just, just an endless amount of, uh, an endless display of love and affection. Um, we spent a lot of time for, uh, when we got the project and we realized the timeline was so quick. I very quickly changed some things um, on my own schedule 
And from the beginning, uh, I made the decision actually without even talking to anyone. I knew that I was going to spend several weeks down there. So I knew I needed to spend a significant amount of time there. This book was not going to get done by the phone. I needed to be there in person. I needed to, you know, set this time aside to be with this, yeah, 80, 87 year old. Um, I should also mention that blessings to my parents. Uh, I actually only met one of my own grandparents. So that's another reason Miss Emily was particularly special. Um, I and I loved my grandmother um, and my grandmother uh, actually passed away at 101 years old. So I had had experience working with older people for a long time. Um, <laughs> well, yes, I'm a millennial. Uh, my parents very much raised me. I'd got I absolutely got the switch. You know, I had a very traditional black American upbringing. Um, and I think that helped me. Um, I very came in, you know, again, while I'm not Gullah Geechee, still black. I know what this is. <laughs> I know to some extent what yes. this is. I know how older black people are. People are. I know, no, I'll it. So I knew what I was doing from that, uh, from that perspective and just very much kind of, again, tried to be, you know, was really cautious about being, uh, mindful about being patient about giving myself enough time, knowing that, you know, yeah, we might have to take a bit of the extra time here. You know, measuring is going to take a while for someone who is not measured. Uh, Marvette and Laverne stepped in so many times, bless them. You know, mommy, wait, Kayla's got to measure this. Kayla's got to look at this. She's got to write this <laughs> down, you know, cause she's, you know, she's cooking. She's doing what she does and she does not measure. So it was, you know, working with her and she understood why, but yeah, working with her to make sure that we were getting this out that the recipes reflected, uh, you know, what she wanted them to reflect and that people could, yeah, bring her cooking into their home. Um, so I spent, I think Marvin and Laverne, six weeks, six weeks, maybe yes, six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so I was down there, yeah, for quite some time. Uh, I would, I stayed in North Charleston. And so I would drive for almost an hour to Miss Emily's house and then would drive back at the end of the day. Sometimes I would stay at her, at her home, depending on what we were working on. I would stay for a couple of days. Um, and I would spend all day. We would interview, we would talk, we would go to the store. Um, I offered several times to drive and never was given the opportunity. Miss <laughs> <Emily. laughs> she drove, she drove with all four and energy. So uh, you know, I helped her, <laughs> but she she was her own woman. She did not usually need the help. She could get around. She was out there in the farmers markets. Everyone, I mean, everyone in this town not only knew her but respected her. I've just never seen. You know, going back to what Terrence said, I think we, you know, millennials, certainly we have our own perspective of race and kind of how we are approaching our interactions with white people. Similarly, obviously comes from a different generation. Um, I was watching white people who, you know, many of whom were very lovely and many of whom I'm sure probably do not think the same way I do. Um, but they love, they absolutely sat there and they sure were going to respect <laughs> Emily. Like, and I just, I think I find that very fascinating because I think she commanded respect from everyone. And I think that just, again, um, signifies who she is um, and, you know, what she represented. But um, yes, we spent all that time together translating it. She was active in the draft. She read them um, along with Marvette and Laverne as we were going through them. She knew everything that was in that book. Um, and we got it done. We got it done. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah. And Terrence, let's talk about your experience in you know, translating and also making, you know, sometimes dishes that are, especially ones that are, you know, for larger groups of people and, and contain a lot of ingredients don't always come across as beautiful. Um, and yet you are able to bring that, you know, the inherent beauty of those things to life. And so let's talk about, you know, translating, you know, something so personal um, mm -hmm. in a way that could be taken in I guess by anyone who picked up the book yeah yeah well I mean so it was definitely like a thing like tr making sure that we translate the recipes right like I even remember there was a lot of like pre rent calls before this project and I know I, I remember the creative director she was she had told us that they they wanted to make sure that these recipes don't get judged up too much and like I get it like my background in food styling is like pretty it's like editorial and commercial and like commercial like mcdonald's or like new york times and lucy she's pretty like she's pretty editorial and they judge they judge in that world <laughs> they do all this judging so and then we're coming into this project that's like we're like making like a textbook in my head is what it seems like and she did not want us to like do too much with the recipes which we 
which you like as a food stylist, you kind of want to. But she and then she made it very clear when we got in there. She was like, I don't want you guys doing too much. Like we're like we're going to cook. We're going to cook the food. And then like this is what it is. And then she and then you could even feel that like when we got there, she was very kind of like I wouldn't say nervous. But like she was in there with us and it was like a long shoot. One of the biggest shoots, th no, the biggest longest shoot I've ever been on. And she was in there with us every day, cooking everything with us, like making sure everything came out nice. Like a lot of those, every, I would say like every photo you see in that book, she had, she touched every photo, every recipe. She was in there cooking. Some stuff she would trust me. She's like, okay, TT, I'm gonna let you do this one. <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna let you do the chicken. <laughs> and I was, but it, it took a, it took like a minute. She was like, she had to like get comfortable. But again, we were there for two and a half weeks, so we had a lot of time. <laughs> and so it, it it was it was nice. But I, I think we were really able to translate the recipes. Like I love all the photos in that book. Like Clay killed that. Killed that. Me and Lucy killed that food style. And like it's everything's beautiful. And like everything is very like with the recipe, with the photo, like it's it's really great. And yeah, but yeah, she really was in there with us with every single recipe. Like she touched everything in that book. And I was impressed. She was out working me at one point and I can work. <laughs> and cause I, it was long days. Like it was like 12 hour days, sometimes 13 hour days. Cause it was like 15 shots a day. And like how many recipes were in that book? It was uh -huh. creeping up on the hundreds, right? Yeah, 25. 25? Yeah. Yeah. 25. yeah, and she was, I was tired, and she was like, <laughs> you better go whip those egg whites. <laughs> <laughs> because, because she was not eating McDonald's, Terrence. That's what it was. A lifetime of not eating McDonald's. And I, I feel so moved by your stories. I feel her spirits, and I've never met her. Um, I almost feel on the verge of tears, but I won't do that because you know, <laughs> recorded for prosper prosperity. But um, I do have um, I have two questions. One is, and this is for um the the maggots. What what were Miss Emily's like staple ingredients, and what were her favorite recipes, and what are your favorite recipes of hers? And to Kayla and Terrence. What are your favorite recipes of hers? So we'll start with Marvette and uh, Laverne. So I think a lot of her staples were, you got to have flour because my mom could take flour and onions and make anything. So you got to have flour, rice, and grits. So those were the things that was always there because she had so many children, she needed something that was going to go a long way. So... Those were, those staples were there all the time. Rice, grits, flour, all the time. And so I think one of her favorite dishes was the shrimp and gravy with grits because she could serve that any time of the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And you could probably have the gravy with grits in the morning, but then you could take that same gravy and serve it over rice in the afternoon. So I think that was one of her favorite. And I also think that the, we call it okra soup in the South. I think the okra soup was another one uh, of her favorites. But, um, and I always loved her uh, red rice uh, with sausage. And I like the shrimp and gravy uh, with grits uh, as well. So I think those were two of my, uh, two of my favorites. My favorite is the squash casserole. And I always tease her and I told her that that's not her recipe, that's my recipe and I make it better than her. And she'll look at me with this look like, you don't even know how to cook. <laughs> so, but I always tease her and I tell her that that's my, that's my favorite is the um, squash casserole. And I do, I will have to say, I do know how to make squash casserole. <laughs> and sometimes I do look in the book and make sure that I have everything right. But I think I know it by heart and how to do it. And if it's anything that I'm asked to make, I will make the squash cast. That's <laughs> my favorite. Thank you. Kayla, Karen, favorite dishes? I will say without it. I mean, all, of course, many of them, the red rice, of course, all of them. 
the deviled crabs. I had a, I had a, we tested that when I first had, we tested that recipe and I had that eyes roll back in your head moment. We had to, we just stopped. I just, I remember just, you know, the scene from Ratatouille when he puts the cheese with the strawberry, <laughs> like it just, it came together at once and it was so incredible. And I have those devil crabs. Anytime I had them, I would go crazy when we when we got to do the shoot and I was doing the shoot. I was specifically asked, I was like, when are y'all shooting the double crabs? So I had to, make sure to be at the at Becky's house uh, on time. So yes, those that was absolutely my favorite recipe and, and one I always recommend to folks. Damn, now I gotta go make it because you <laughs> sold me on that, Kayla. Thank you. All right. She wasn't um, stingy I with the meat. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. It it was true. It was crab. We were getting crab in every single bite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'd say I have two. Okay. And they're actually they're like two dishes that I grew up on a lot. And I see my dad on this call. He um he made fried chicken for us a lot. But mm -hmm. that fried chicken like it's I have fried chicken and sweet potato pie growing up a lot. But she had her processes. Were like kind of game changing for me. Mm. Like the her fried chicken, like she does it. She does it in the brown paper bag, and mm. what I've always grew up like dredging it in the egg and the flour, and then frying it like that, which is great, great. But then the in the brown paper bag, you put the flour in there, throw the chicken in there, and then do the shake, and then there's not you every piece, you every crevice of that chicken is right. crispy. No, no, no crevice left behind. And that was really such a game changer. That's how I do fried chicken now, every time. <laughs> and then the sweet potato pie. She has this method for when she makes the sweet potato pie. Like, I never knew that the strings, like, you know how sweet potatoes have strings in them? I just thought that's how it is. I didn't know. I never knew you could take them out. And so mm -hmm. she she whips the sweet, she whips the um the sweet potatoes. And then she uses, like, the whisk to pull the strings out of the sweet potato pie. It's just it changes everything for the sweet potato pie. I'm I'm just used to like it being a little stringy, but then she dips the <laughs> she uses the whisk to take the strings out of the sweet potato pie, and, and you know it's like a textural thing. It changes the whole the whole moment of the sweet potato pie, and then that so yeah those two and that's, that's how I brilliant. do those. That's brilliant, actually. That's brilliant. That Kayla, that speaks to that brilliance we were talking about. Um, yeah, because texture obviously is like at least for me. Texture is a very important piece of food. I mean, obviously taste is, but texture is right up there. And so, yeah, that sounds, that is a game changer. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah that is. Course. Yes. And so the question for all of you um, is, you know, so you have this book, book is like going like gangbusters. It gets, you know, first a semi-finalist nod, and then it gets a James Beard Award nod. What were the reactions? Like the community reactions, your reaction, like what? I mean, did people <laughs> even care? You know, the <laughs> well, I think, I think everybody, yeah, I think everybody was really <laughs> excited. But my mom, she wasn't excited. It didn't bother her at all. You know, I'm call her on the phone and says, Mommy, guess what? Your book is a New York Times bestseller. She says, oh, Really? really? <laughs> and so it didn't matter to her that that didn't even matter you know to her all she ever wanted was for people to eat her food and like her food because she poured everything in you know uh to her food you know it was a lot of love that she put into her food and that's basically uh what she cared about you know all the other stuff she didn't care about that it was just you know this food and that was it <laughs> but you know everybody was really proud for her and happy that her book made the New York Times bestseller list and you know when it was nominated for a James Beard award and but none of that bothered her whatsoever that's just who she was you know so you know that was that was just Miss Emily mommy as you know as we call her I saw the question yeah. um, just a second ago, but for me, I think my dad would have said, this is what he used to call her. Oh, gal, <laughs> you did that. <laughs> you made it. Yeah, you did. So yeah. daddy knew mommy was always cooking, 
and always taking food to somebody doing something. It didn't matter if she was going to the car dealership, mommy was taking food. Daddy knew that about her. So I am sure he was just as pleased knowing that, you know, he left us some 17 years ago and look at MP is what he used to call her. Mm -hmm. You done, he would have said, you done good. Yeah. You done good. I'm proud of you. Oh, yeah. That's really beautiful. I, I, and this goes into um, essentially my last question, which is, you know, we'll be through the whole group and Marvette and, and Laverne will have the last word on that. But Kayla, Terrence, how does, how does Miss Emily's legacy inspire you today? Well, she, Miss Emily had a lot of quotes, but I remember, I believe one of the last things she said to me, because I had went down there for the, we went, I went down there for the project. And then I went back for Thanksgiving, actually, because they invited me for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm jealous. I am jealous. <laughs> it was a it was a grand occasion. <laughs> I had a I had a good time. And I I one of the last things she no, but then we went back for the book launch, the book launch after that. And one of the last things she had said to me that sticks with me that I just think is just so real. She was like, she was like, TT. She was like, your plan is not God's plan, and God's plan is not your plan. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and that just, I feel like that just like low-key defines my whole life. And I just take that with me as I go through like life in general, because you know, it gets hard out here. And she, yeah. That. Thank you, Terry. Of course. Definitely words of wisdom. Kayla? Um, you know, my mom, who I believe is on this call, um, she told one of the main things she's told me that has stuck with me um, all my life is to run your own race. Um, that is something she told, she told all my family, but I think she told particularly me, maybe she, maybe she saw something, but it is something that has stuck with me my entire life. And Miss Emily actually is the first person in my life to sort of communicate the same thing um what miss emily demonstrated and what her legacy shows you know i i again i say this all the time but i talk about the luckiness of being able to do this um to have been around an african-american elder to have been around someone who had such a distinct history and was from such a distinctive culture and had a very personal and specific perspective on the world. Miss Emily was her own woman. That is something that I recognized from the beginning. And I think, you know, we're as yes, we're in this space of talking, um, you know, about choice and about identity, you know, Miss Emily made the decisions that were for her life um, and for who she wanted to be and for her community. And so I think about her legacy and I think the thing I really learned from her and carry on is just the beauty and possibilities of Black womanhood, um, the beauty and the, the possibilities mm -hmm. and um, the sort of need to honor that throughout your life uh, with regardless of your field or, you know, where you end up or your partner. Miss Emily taught me so much about respect, about <laughs> respect, about you know, demanding yeah. what you need, about standing up for yourself, about, you know, showing up by doing the work that you're going to do, showing up for other people and also making sure that they are also showing up to you. You know, Miss Emily gave love and she received love, right? Like oh, yeah. it was two-way street. So yeah, um, her legacy, both as a culinary professional, but also as a person will stay with me forever. Thank you so much, Kayla. And Marvette and Laverne, the reason I kept you last on this particular question is because I know, you know, Miss Emily's legacy continues to inspire you because you guys have been doing a lot to preserve her legacy. And I think, you know, I think folks need to know about it. So if you good guys could, you know, talk a little bit about that, including that, what is it, the pepper jelly and the pimento cheese? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to, uh, just allow me to say, you know, when I think, when we talk about Miss Emily, 
and I talk about her to other people, there's a lot of C's for me because mommy had character, she had culture, she had courage, she was committed to what she was doing as far as cooking for people. She was compassionate, but, and then she had children, not just her children, but she had other people's children. So, you know, that Miss One Little Miss Emily, she just had so much, you know, and a lot of times when we think about the legacy you know, we view it in terms of money or property that has been passed down uh, to us. But for me, my mom's legacy is measured by the impact that she has on people and on the world. And that's because what people thought about her, what they say about her, what they do because of her, how they live their lives or their lives have changed because of her, her love, her, you know, her respect, you know, and it just, you know, it inspires me to continue, you know, some of the traditional things that my mom would always do, like, you know, going out into the community, you know, giving back. And like at Christmas time, we would always make pepper jelly and pimento cheese and other goodies. My sister Dee Dee would bake muffins or cakes or whatever. And we would take those things to the people in the community. And so um, this past Christmas, that's what we did. We were at that because, you know, we were inspired to do that because we know that, that, she would have done. that you know, that is what she would have done if she was still here. So, yes, it's a lot of work but it's a lot of love that went into that work. So we did that. I mean, we probably made 200 jars of pepper jelly, you know, the Christmas time and made big batches of pimento cheese and, you know, gave it out, you know, uh, to people because my mom always say it will come back threefold to you. And so, you know, I mean, I'm just inspired to continue, you know, to have her legacy be kept alive. You know, because like Becky Smith said to her, Miss Emmy, the world needs to know who you are. And also, I think that my mom, the opportunity that she was given at the age of 87, you know, her legacy and the opportunity that she was given, it changed the world through food for the good. And I think that's that will live on for a long time. Yeah. And you, but you guys have gotten Emily Maggot Day um, yeah. in, in July. July. Yeah. July. And then y'all have been, um, you know, having um, some uh, uh, essentially pop ups at museums. And, and yeah. And, um, and then you'll also be at Charleston Wine and Food next Ooh, week with the yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, you guys are doing a whole lot um, yeah. to preserve her legacy. And I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys like championing this. I think it's important, not just for people who, you know, like to eat, mm -hmm. but also those people <laughs> who like to cook, but people who, you know, I think a lot of people need to be inspired, especially these days. Um, oh, yeah. But also, you know, I think for us as a diaspora, because our storytelling is so oral, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our legacies have been lost and then we're celebrated. We're not given the flowers um, while we're still here. And Emily right. um, got to get her flowers while she was still here. And then we continue to to honor her, you know? Oh, yeah. and, and so, you know, I want to give y'all some flowers now too. So I want to find out what everybody's up to. That's my, <laughs> that's my final question. What are y'all, what are you excited about, Kayla? I know what you're doing. I looked at your, your little resume on your website, um, but I want to know what everybody's up to. Like brag on yourself on this, on this webinar. Let people know what y'all <laughs> up to now. Well, I can say we have been extremely busy since my mom passed away. Never a dull moment, you know, and I really, truly believe that she's looking down, smiling on us, knowing that we're carrying on her dream and doing the things that people continuously ask us to do, things that we had on her calendar that, you know, we thought we would cancel. No, nope, people came through. We still want you guys to do this for us. So 
we've had events in her honor uh, mm -hmm. since she's yeah. passed away. And I'll just take you from Sunday on down. Sunday, we had a uh, team that came out from California and New York, food writers wanting to do some writing on rice and rice and, and the culture and what, you know, it meant to my mom and stuff like that. So Sunday, of course, Laverne and Didi, they cooked and served the meal and they had a very good time. Not only did we, did they cook for them um, when they walked in, I did, I got up, did the string beans. I cut them up. We had some fresh string beans. And after I cooked them, I just put it on the wood stove and I figured I'd just let it stay there and got hot. Now that's something that my mom would do. She cooks on her wood stove all the time. So we had the opportunity to do that. The writers, they loved it. Uh, like to see the fire in the stove and cooking on the stove and stuff like that. Um, not only did we cook for them, we took them on a tour. That's what my mom would have done. So we had uh, Gretchen Smith from the museum open the museum for them on a Sunday and the museum is closed. So that shows a lot of respect for Emily and her children as well, that somebody's going to do something even if they're closed. So she gave them a tour of the museum, uh, which they have a Gullah Geechee section in the museum and it features my mom as well. Um, from the museum, we went to the mill where the rice and grits and all peas and all that stuff is made on Edisto. We took them there. From the mill, we took them to the beach where Becky Smith lived and how they just looked out on the ocean and saw several different islands out there. And they were blown away by, you know, just this little piece of heaven that my mom talked about. So people can read it in her book. And when you get to Edisto, you yes, see it and you feel it as well. Um, we also had the honor of going back to the seaweed um, exhibition last weekend and they wanted to recognize us at the seaweed. Um, that was one of my mom's event that she did last year, one of second to the last event that she did before she passed away. So that was very nice. The people you know, knew who we were and everything. And people came up to us and told us, oh, you know, I have your mom's book. And, you know, and it made you feel good. You feel really good, proud, special, little old mommy. This is what you've done. <laughs> this is what you <laughs> left behind for us to carry on. So, and I believe in the heart of my heart that my siblings will continue cooking and do that. Yes, I remember <laughs> you're not the one that's cooking. I know. No, I remember you telling me that. I like that part. <laughs> No. But um, we had a lot. We had a lot of stuff going on. Um, we had the wine and food festival coming up that we've been invited to. We have the um, well, we did the event at the new International uh, African American Museum in Charleston. Mm -hmm. They wanted to honor my mom, and that was titled the uh, life. What was it entitled? The the soul behind the, the soul, soul behind the soul of Emily Meg of Emily Megan. So that was very good. We had a great panel discussion there as well, and it turned out really good. And I believe um, we have a memorial coming. Up. We have a, well, we have a memorial coming up in April for her, and mm -hmm. um, we've just been blessed with a whole lot with what she has left from her legacy, not I'm just by she food. Is but we have stuff that's coming up next year as well. And I'm like, okay, when will we slow down? But it's just the love that's poured in behind the soul of Emily Maggot. And just out of um, nowhere, we had sad Sunday as well, a visitor to the, the director of the Spoleto Festival. Mm -hmm. He has invited us to the events at Spoleto. He came to my mom's house on Sunday as well and had a great time along with the team. So a lot of things are still happening and we just, you know, embrace all the, the great opportunities and moments that she has, you know, left here for us. The legacy is just still rich, as rich as it was when we started and it's getting richer. You know, I look at, you know, what we have to do. It's not even a third of what she had 
went through and what not even a third of what she had to endure to get to where she was at that time in her life and to make it to 90 years old. It was a struggle, but she mm -hmm. endured that struggle. And I believe she embraced it with all her heart. And every time, you know, we are faced with challenges and stuff like that, I always laugh and say, well, mommy would say, well, it's all right. <laughs> It's all right to you, but at the yeah. time, it seems like the burden is so heavy. And yeah. with her calm voice and saying, well, that's all right, or it's all right, it just makes you realize that, you know, when you go through things in life, you take a step back and you just breathe. It's not for you at the moment to answer. She always said, you don't have to give an answer for everything or you don't have to say something back to everything someone says to you. You just sit back and you wait. And at the appointed time, you will be given that answer that you need to answer the question without hostility. You right. know what I mean? You and, and it and it turns out for the best. I mean, my mom has left some great memories for us to carry on and to and to live by. And I see that. I mean, you know, the people that have been commenting have given some <laughs> amazing um you know, essentially uh, props to your mom uh, throughout this uh, discussion. And so um, since we're a little over time, I still want to know what Kayla and Terrence have going on next. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing a few final words or what, what y'all are up to next. Um, so yeah, unmute yourselves and let us know. And we have a couple of things coming up next year as well. Okay. <laughs> I'm not as busy as Marvara and Laverne. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there, there are. I'm not that busy. But uh, the two, I did just start a temporary role at Eater Houston, um, yeah. which, as I mentioned, I'm originally from uh, from Houston, Texas. Um, so we I'm on the Eater team, which is wonderful. The Eater uh, site is fantastic. Um, and you all, fo food folks, and anyone who's new to food um, who's on this call, please do check it out. Mm -hmm. um, so I will be in Houston for a few months, but I am also working on two major projects, including um, a book on African-American foodways in Texas, the first mm -hmm. cookbook, actually, with Chef Christopher Williams, mm -hmm. um, who was featured on High on the Hog on the Texas episode. Um, and I am also working on a barbecue cookbook uh, with Ronnie Scott, Pitmaster Ronnie Scott. Um, awesome. So that has oh, been Carolina. wonderful people. Awesome. <laughs> and Terrence. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, as you mentioned, <laughs> as you mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm the executive sous chef at Platform by the James Beard Foundation. So you could always come visit me there on Pier 57 in Chelsea, mm -hmm. if you have, for, for those who know New York. And then um, I have, I wrote some, an essay, and I have some recipes coming out in a while entertaining magazine. And oh, that comes out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that comes out in April. So you can pre order that now and yeah my first time ever writing not about not like an essay mm -hmm. which was very nice and then wrote a nice recipe so yeah and I'm also always open to recipe development opportunities okay so anybody that wants me to write a recipe um, for their you mean you worked on a you worked on a New York Times bestseller I think I think you'll be <laughs> <laughs> sure your inbox will be filled um and so thank you all this has been a wonderful discussion i you know i really felt like i really got to know edisto um that i really got to know miss emily um i feel closer to you guys too um and and uh you know this has been a really moving uh, and beautiful discussion. And the best part about it is that we can watch it again. Um, yeah. The James Beard Foundation has a virtual library. So we're on YouTube. Um, so you'll, you know, in a couple of days, you'll be able to see that archived into our virtual library. So you can kind of relive the experience. Maybe you're in the middle of reading the book or rereading the book. Um, and so you'll have the opportunity to even get uh, a, a stronger sense of, of place and Miss Emily through the people um, that loved her. And, and now I want to go to Edisto. I want to see, I want to oh, see on. what y'all talking about. Um, <laughs> it's, it speaks to me as a tropical person. Um, and so thank you guys for not only your work with Miss Emily, but your, your, you, you know, um, in, in each of your corners, you are essentially continuing Miss Emily's legacy by doing the work that you're doing 
you know, being mm -hmm. on the path that you are on. So, you know, thank you for, you know, making this a really lively and beautiful conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the beautiful comments. Somebody said they canceled their work meetings to be here. That's <laughs> awesome. <Yes. laughs> um, you know, that truly tells me, um, that truly tells me how, you know, how important these kinds of conversations and this kind of um, archiving really truly is. So um, you can visit us at jamesbeard.org to find out more about our organization and our initiatives, um, to be able to donate to some of our worthwhile programs. Um, you know, you make sure you follow Kayla and Terrence on IG. I know Marvette and Vern, they can only do the <laughs> socials, but you know, we're happy to share if you have um, any any uh, questions about what they're up to, because we're we're like this now, I think. So um, so thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.